officially noon, so welcome everyone uh, to the whole farm efficiency webinar series. Uh, I'm Camilo Laje. Uh, I'm a dairy management specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension Southwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team, and I will be your host for today. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Dairy Tech, for their generous support. Uh, the sponsor their sponsorship enables us to offer these programs free, free of cost for you. So our speaker of, for today is Dr. Sabine Mann. Uh, Sabine is an associate professor at Cornell Department of Population Medicine and Diagnostic Science. Uh, Dr. Mann specializes in metabolism, physiology, and the relationship with nutritional immunology during transition phases. Uh, Dr. Mann will be sharing today insights on how to optimize colostrum to maximize its benefits to the farm. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A. Uh, and if you have any tech issues, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat and we are going to try to help you. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to welcome Sabine to share her screen and take it over. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope you can... I'm um, going to stop sharing my screen so you can. Great. Yes. Okay. So right. So hopefully you can see my screen here. Yes. Yes. Great. So thanks of all. Thank. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction. Um, to um uh, be here today, talk about one of my favorite topics, um, colostrum, something that we've been thinking about um, uh, quite a bit in the last few years. It's a it's an old topic. We've known about the importance of colostrum for a long time, but um, we're revisiting some of the things we know about colostrum, and I hope I can share some uh, important updates for you today that you can uh, make use of on the farm. I uh, also wanted to acknowledge uh, Trent Westhoff here on this webinar. Some of the data that I'll be sharing today is coming out of his PhD, um, which has a focus on colostrum and um, you'll see that he's looked at this in a few different aspects. So with this, I'll get started. Um, I hope that I will leave plenty of time for questions in the end of this. So um, if something's not addressed in the webinar, um, we could talk about it afterwards. So why does colostrum um, matter? Um, I think we all agree that Colostrum has a very large influence on keeping our calves healthy. The data suggests that this is true. This has been shown uh, over a century ago that when we deprive calves of colostrum, the first milking um, that the cow makes, that we have these issues with calf survival and health. And we now know that um, immunoglobulins and transferring what we call passive immunity antibodies into the calf is extremely important. But we also have to recognize that colostrum has different um, other components that I'll be sharing in the next slide that are important, especially for the newborn as they get used to life outside of the uterus. As far as diseases go, we know that colostrum um, has an important part to play in preventing disease in calves specifically pre-weaning diseases. And the three most common diseases during this time are diarrhea, pneumonia, and umbilical disease or navel ill. We also know that we still have about a third of our calves on farms uh, experience one of those health events pre-weaning, and that we have about 5% mortality in calves in the pre-weaning period. So we still have room um, to improve uh, health in these calves in the pre-weaning period. And colostrum is one of the most important strategies to do that. So I said, let's talk a little bit about what is actually in colostrum. Um, we have this thick fluid, uh, sometimes more yellow than other times. Um, so it can vary even just when you're looking at it in color. And sometimes it's so thick, it's, it's almost like honey. Um, and we know it's got a lot of solids in there um, compared to milk. So we only have about three quarters of colostrum that is water. Water is very important for the neonates because they will have um, this need for uh, drinking. And so colostrum, among other things, uh, supplies some of this warm water with it. Solids are higher in colostrum than they are in mature milk. So we have about 23, 24% solids. So about one quarter of the colostrum portion is, is uh, solids um, in most cases. And these solids are made up mostly of fat and protein. The fat is a really important component for the neonate because it has a lot of energy. Um, those calves are born, you know, this time of the year, they're born into an environment that's much colder than what they're used to in the uterus. They quickly have to get energy to keep warm and the fat component is extremely important for that. 
Then, of course, the protein component is where we have our antibodies, um, and that is a very high component, about 14% of protein is in colostrum. And uh, among other things, as the IDG, we also have the IgA and the IgM, so different antibodies that have different roles to play in the calf. But most importantly is the IgG component that I'm sure you've all heard about. And that's the one that we make um, responsible or we, we hold responsible for transferring the passive immunity in the calf. Sugar component is lower in colostrum than it is in milk. Um, and those sugar components, although lower, play an important role in preparing the gut um, of the calf for being able to host what we call the microbiome, the bacteria that grow in the, in the gut. So although this component is lower, the specific makeup of these sugars is important in establishing um, the gut maturity in these neonates. And then we have minerals in colostrum, very important, specifically the calcium component, which sometimes gets our cows in trouble because they're putting a lot of calcium in, in the colostrum, but it's important for the calf to receive um, this mineral and other minerals in colostrum. And then there's a tiny component that I call other. And when we open this up, um, it shows just how broad the uh, the ingredients, the components of colostrum are. Uh, colostrum includes uh, trace minerals, vitamins in a concentration that's much higher than mature milk, uh, different growth factors that we um, think are important uh, based on the data we have today in, again, maturing the gut, being able to take more nutrients out of the feed. Um, these growth factors will hasten the development of the gut epithelium, the surface where we take up the nutrients and are important in that regard. There is uh, live immune cells in colostrum that come from the dam. Um, to date, we are not entirely sure what these immune cells might do in the calf, um, but we also have a component in uh, the colostrum that is antimicrobially active. So we have antimicrobial peptides and so-called complement protein, and those together um, reduce the bacterial survival um, in colostrum. So this, I'm going to get back to this later on when I talk about colostrum contamination um, and what to take into account when you're trying to feed colostrum with as low of a bacterial contamination as possible. And then different other components that we are actually still discovering um, and trying to figure out what the role of these components is in the growth and health of the calf. So with this, just a quick reminder of when do we actually have colostrum production happening. As you know, colostrum is being produced during the, the dry period, and we call this process colostogenesis. The dry period is very important because it allows for um, the cow to store these components in the udder and makes them um, be able to condense them in this very thick liquid that I introduced with this higher component um, of dry matter. And the most important um, transfer of antibodies into colostrum happens probably in the last few days before calving, but we have indication that the transfer starts um, as soon as we have the dry off process um, happen. And we have, um, we, we notice because when cows are dry for longer, we can see some more increase in this IgG component, antibody component into colostrum. So in short, it's a long process. Um, the most important transfer of the antibodies happens in the last few days before calving. And then we also recognize that the transfer of antibodies into colostrum doesn't stop right at parturition um, at calving, but there's actually a continued um, uptake of these antibodies into what we call transition milk. And I'll be speaking a little bit about the role of transition milk at the end of the webinar as well. So we know most about colostogenesis, the making of colostrum in terms of when the antibodies go in there. We know very little about the other components um, when they happen to go in into colostrum. We think that likely um, it's very similar to IgG in that there is some of it going into colostrum over a longer period of time, and maybe there is some mass transfer of these uh, growth factors into um, colostrum right before the cow calves. As you can see here, um, it's important to note this because when cows calve prematurely, for some reason or the other, they may not have had time to complete this process. And so cows that calve too early often suffer from poor quality of colostrum because this process was not completed um, the way it was intended to be completed. So with this, um, I just wanted to 
uh, remind us of the five cues or introduce the five cues to those of you who have not heard about them. Um, I believe those are uh, very helpful to guide our thinking about how we um, manage colostrum on farm um, and which aspects we should always take into account. In these five cues, we have quality, squeaky clean, quantity of colostrum, quickness, and quantifying the failure of transfer of passive immunity or FTPI. I'll start with the first two that concern the colostrum component itself, quality and squeaky clean. As far as quality goes, um, the, most, um, the most attention is usually paid to the immunoglobulin or the antibody component, because as I mentioned before, it is so important for transferring the passive immunity. And we know the passive immunity in turn is what is responsible for keeping our calves healthy in this pre period. So how can we know if we have good colostrum? Um, and some of you might uh, use these uh, digital refractometers, or some of you might be uh, using these handheld refractometers. I have an example of one of each in, on this slide. And what we actually do here is we use the way that colostrum um, absorbs light to give us an estimation of how good it is. So it's not a direct measurement of how much, uh, how, many, how many antibodies are in there, but it's giving us an indirect measurement uh, to try to estimate how good colostrum might be. And I have some numbers on here on the bottom for those of you who are interested in the specifics of this, but what, what I can tell you in summary is that this estimation is pretty good at distinguishing poor from good quality colostrum. It's not perfect. Um, you, you're always, you know, having a little bit of error on either side, um, sometimes deciding colostrum is bad when actually it was good enough, and sometimes deciding it was good enough when actually in reality it wasn't good enough. Um, but for an, a, a method that you can use easily on farm that's affordable and quick and uh, doesn't take much to train somebody on, I think this is a pretty, pretty good tool that we have um, available to us. So what do we actually do when we um, measure this, this BRICS percentage um, or when we when we look at this uh, refractometer against the light? So here's just an example of uh, a data set where we are using a digital refractometer and I have the BRICS percent on the y-axis and I'm showing you the IgG concentration on the x-axis. So the actual antibody concentration measured in a laboratory method. And so you can see that um, they correlate pretty well with each other. But you can also see that this cloud is a little bit wide around this line that, that we're drawing around it, meaning that you're not exact in uh, predicting the IgG component with this BRICS reading. So again, just trying to convey the message that it's an okay method to estimate, but it's not an exact method where you're actually measuring the, the antibody um, concentration itself. Important when you use these refractometers, and again, there's one um, just as an example that um, we frequently use. Um, keep in mind that most refractometers um, need to be calibrated uh, before you use it. Um, and we recommend to do this once a day before you start using them for the day. And this calibration is also important to recognize if the little window where you're putting your sample is maybe dirty, maybe there's some fat component left over, um, which will actually make your readings uh, falsely high or low, can go in both directions. So just a reminder here to look into the instructions for the refractometer you're using, making sure that it's uh, clean, A, eh? um, and that you're using um, uh, a calibration solution. For some of those, it's just plain distilled water to make sure that when you're putting water on there, it goes back to zero. What you don't want to do is use these without cleaning and calibration because it will, over time, um, give you the wrong results for your colostrum measurements. Um, and so this is important to just recognize. Um, and that's something we do um, in our research studies always. And, and we realize when we do that, that often we have to go back and clean it again so it comes back down to zero. So squeaky clean. Um, squeaky clean goes to the question of bacterial contamination. And why is this important? Um, it's important because we want to be able to harvest colostrum and store it so that we have it available when a calf is born. That is just much easier to um, get colostrum into calves as quickly as our recommendations would suggest. So we want to be able to refrigerate or even freeze colostrum and then use it later. 
when we refrigerate and freeze colostrum, we have to realize that uh, the bacteria are going to be able to survive in both instances. And in the case of refrigeration, can also keep multiplying as long as this colostrum is in the fridge. So when you're just refrigerating colostrum, it's important to remember that this is a short-term storage. Uh, ideally, you want to use colostrum within one day after harvest because there is this increased growth of some of these bacteria um, in the fridge. If you have to leave it in the fridge for longer, um, you wanna always make sure you label it with date and bricks percentage and then use the oldest colostrum first so that you don't have anything that's slipping through and might stay in there for you know four, five, six, seven days because um, it's, it's not organized such that you're using the, the oldest one first. If for some reason you do need to extend the duration of storage in the in the fridge, you can add potassium sorbate um, to this and extend the the shelf life, so to call, um, of colostrum a little bit because it will prevent some of this overgrowth of bacteria. And we recommend to uh, refrigerate colostrum in individual feeding portion containers such that you're not taking a big batch of colostrum out of the fridge, filling up one uh, feeding portion and putting the rest back in. In the meantime, this colostrum will get warm. You're going to be handling it and there's more contamination. So ideally, you already fill it into portions that you can then use um, directly for feeding. Freezing is a method for longer term storage. So you can get six to 12 months out of this, we think. Um, we're currently doing a study to actually check on, on this because there's not, not much data out there. But you, you can store colostrum pretty safely in the freezer for at least uh, three to six months according to what we know right now. Make sure that when you do that, you use uh, frost-free freezers. So there's freezers out there that will automatically defrost once in a while, and you don't want to have that happen um, because you can potentially damage your colostrum if it forms up in these uh, thaw cycles. Again, like in the refrigeration, you want to freeze and thaw the colostrum individual portion so that you're not um, uh, thawing a, a bigger portion than having to store some of the leftover. And then when you warm the colostrum, if you freeze it, you want to make sure that you use a water bath um, to heat it up. That's not going to destroy the components of colostrum. So the, the rule of thumb is to never go over 60 degrees Celsius when you're heating up colostrum. That's the same temperature as we would be using for heat treatment um, of colostrum or so-called pasteurization. We prefer to heat up thawed colostrum. Um, so if you can plan ahead and thaw it overnight in the fridge, if you need it the next day, it's much easier to heat up um, a thawed colostrum portion than if you're putting a whole ice brick into the water and then having to heat that up over a, an extended period of time. And then something that um, I try to always mention is that um, we should not be throwing colostrum into a water bath and, and keeping it there for several hours um, as we wait for a cow to calf or you know, as we have to go do different chores on the farm and then return to um, feeding colostrum because this water bath um, will warm up the colostrum, which is what we want. But if you keep it warm for an extended period of time, again, you can damage some of the components of colostrum. And this temperature is fantastic for bacteria to start growing. And they can grow pretty fast. And I'll show you some data to, um, to support that. When you're freezing colostrum, colostrum cells will become non-viable. They will burst. Um, that's something just to keep in mind as we continue to learn more about what colostrum cells might actually do for the cat. So what if you have um, some bacterial contamination? How much is too much? Um, our goals in the industry haven't changed over the last years, and we still consider a good quality colostrum to have under 100,000 um, cells uh, on the total plate count and under 10,000 uh, bacteria and on the coliform count. It's worth uh, working with uh, your advisors on the farm to just get a few colostrum samples to send them in for growth. There's also some on-farm methods where you can grow it yourself if you are concerned about the bacterial contamination of your colostrum at all, just to see where you're at. And where's contamination coming from most often? This is a, uh, now a little bit of an older study from Dr. Sandra Godden's lab, and they try to ask the question, okay, so we find these bacteria in colostrum and we know this is not good for um, the quality of a colostrum, where is it coming from? And it's not, for the most part, coming out of the cow, the, the moment where colostrum gets contaminated the most is at harvest. So it's usually in the harvesting system, in the bucket, 
um, where most of this contamination is coming from. And then they didn't actually find much additional contamination when they were feeding colostrum um, through an esophageal feeder or a tube system. Um, they really contributed most of the contamination through the bucket um, system. And so this just reminds us that we need to sanitize and clean um, our colostrum harvesting equipment the same way, same you know, precise uh, process that we will be using for all of our milking equipment. So what about the heat treatment then? Um, heat treatment, as I said before, is usually at 60 degrees um, Celsius for 60 minutes. And we use heat treatment to try to help us with bacterial contamination if all the efforts that we have been making still don't lead to very clean colostrum, or if you're trying to control certain bacteria, certain pathogens on the farm, and you're using heat treatment of colostrum and pasteurization of milk um, to do so. It's important to recognize that when you use heat treatment, either in a bag system or in a, in a, in a bath or in a batch system, you're not producing an entirely sterile product. So that's why we call it heat treatment. And we're trying to shy away from calling it pasteurization because pasteurization would imply that we're actually getting in a completely sterile product where everything is um, dead inside. That's not the, the case for colostrum heat treatment, because if we were heating it up to the point where we're killing all the bacteria, you're going to end up with something that looks more like yogurt or cream cheese, and that's very hard to feed to cats. The heat treatment of colostrum, because it kills bacteria, can improve the storability of colostrum in the fridge, and that, that's one of the reasons why it is used. It may also improve um, the uptake of antibodies, because if you think about antibodies, their job is to bind bacteria. If they're binding bacteria already in colostrum before it's actually being fed, then they cannot um, bind bacteria in the cap. So they're kind of already lost, you know, they, they, they've done their job and they lost their effectiveness before you even um, having them go into the calf. And, and uh, that's a loss for these antibodies for the calf. So if there's a little, uh, little contamination, or if you can reduce the contamination by heat treatment, that can improve the IgG uptake. The bacteria that you might want to control and farm that heat treatment is used for, for example, mycoplasma, salmonella, E. coli, and then the organism that causes Yoni's disease called um, MAP. If you do use heat treatment, it's important to recognize that the entire process takes longer than one hour because um, if you've been standing next to a pasteurizer like I have for some research projects, you see that there's a ramp up time until you get to the um, correct temperature and there's a cool down time. So we're looking more at two, two and a half hours of the entire process. So that's a long period of time that colostrum is exposed to heat. And that's why it's important that once this process is over, we're trying to get it to cool down as quickly as possible. So on, on some uh, farms, uh, folks use uh, ice makers to rapidly cool down colostrum. In some farms where they're using batch pasteurization of colostrum heat treatment, they're using, for example, frozen bottles that they can throw into the colostrum buckets. There's different methods to use, but you have to just focus on how do I get this colostrum to cool down very quickly after this heat treatment process is over. If you're not achieving that, um, you're risking having overgrowth of the bacteria that are surviving this heat treatment process. And they love hanging out at around 37 to 40 degrees Celsius. That's where they feel best um, and they will rapidly um, grow again. So then you just heat treated the colostrum to get the bacteria down. Now you're not cooling it down for one reason or the other and you're allowing um, the regrowth of these bacteria. And then similarly too for the uh, freezing process, the colostal cells uh, in heat treated colostrum are also not surviving this. Um, and again, um, as we learn more about the role of colostrum immune cells, this might become more important in the future. I do recommend to occasionally check your heat treatment process. You can do this um, quite easily with thermometers that, you know, there's different thermometers in the market. I have uh, one example up here in this corner. That's a little Bluetooth thermometer that has an immersible probe that you can actually hang into the water bath and monitor the entire heat treatment process and make sure that your um, that your um, uh, pasteurizer or heat treatment equipment is still performing the way that you're intending it to be. And if not, um, then you need to fix that and get the temperature back to the correct 
um, values. If you're too high, you're destroying immunoglobulins, um, IgG. If you're too low, you're not getting to where you're reducing the bacteria um, to the extent that you're that you're hoping to get. So that's why it's important to occasionally check with um, a temperature sensor. Again, the, the cool-down methods, um, this is um, some examples um, that we have put together um, on the slide. So you can pre-cool the bucket system in a freezer, uh, as shown here in the picture provided by Trent. There's an ice maker in the middle. Um, these are very handy to have around. Um, I think they're about $1,500 to $2,000 to produce ice continuously, like we would be doing in the laboratory, and you can throw that directly onto the bags, and that's very nice to pull them down. And then on the right side is an example of a frozen water bottle that's being thrown into um, a bucket to cool it down. You just have to recognize if you're doing that, these frozen water bottles need to be sanitized exactly the same way as all the other equipment so that you're not contaminating your colostrum by these water bottles that you're, um, that you're using to cool down um, the colostrum itself. So um, again, the point of um, if you're heat treating colostrum, it's important to recognize it's not um, a complete sanitation process, not a sterilization process. Um, I have an example here from one data set where we looked at the bacteria in uh, a few different samples, and they're always shown in the raw form on the left of the graph and in the heat treated form on the right side of the graph. And you can see the total bacteria count the coliform count in the middle, and then a staphylococcus specific count on the right. And you will see here that, yes, heat treatment does a pretty good job of reducing the bacteria um, overall in this very left-hand graph. And particularly, it does a good job for killing coliform bacteria. And it doesn't do as good of a job to kill staphylococcus. Um, and there are a few data sets out there, but the ones that are out there would suggest that this is true across um, these different data sets that ground positive, specifically Staphylococcus, um, can survive the heat treatment process pretty well. So while you get a median reduction in total bacterial counts across these samples of 93%, which sounds great, we have a range in 45 to 100%. So in some of these samples, um, you're barely getting half um, of the bacteria after the heat treatment process. And so going back to this uh, point of not letting the colostrum uh, stand around warm after you heat treat it, we did a little study, um, one of our uh, students here in the veterinary program over the summer last year, um, looking at what happens if I still have leftover um, bacteria and colostrum after heat treatment, what would that do to regrowth if I kept the colostrum warm at around 37, 38 degrees Celsius? And so, to try this out, she um, contaminated colostrum specifically after it was heat treated and compared the growth of the bacteria in that heat treated colostrum to raw colostrum and to frozen colostrum. And so I wanna draw your attention to the yellow line, which is the colostrum that was heat treated um, and the green line, which is a control group of colostrum replacer. And you can see here that both in colostrum replacer and heat treated colostrum, bacteria grew pretty rapidly. Um, and uh, this is E. coli. E. coli can multiply in 20 minutes. So you can see how it is important that you're not letting this colostrum um, sit around in water bath for an extended period of time. Importantly, we also have to recognize that um, heat treatment is not the fix, the fix to all of our problems, because even if we heat treat colostrum, we still have some inhibition of um, absorption of immunoglobulins in this colostrum, as shown here on, on this slide provided um, by Trent, that he put this together from a publication from Gelsinger et al. in 2015. So what we're showing here is that once you have contamination of colostrum with bacteria, even if you heat treat it, there will still be lower apparent efficiency of um, absorption, meaning less of the immunoglobulin that's ending up in the gut is actually taking up into the circulation of the calf. So that's why it's important to work on both ends, trying to prevent bacterial contamination and harvest, in addition to if you're using heat treatment, but not relying solely on heat treatment um, for, for uh, pushing down your bacterial counts. So with this, I would move on to um, quantity quickness and quantifying failure of trans failure of transfer of passive immunity, FTPI, in the calf. 
and um, starting with how much to feed, so colostrum feeding recommendations, and this is recommendations for a single feeding. Um, we, we think there is some uh, benefit to uh, paying attention to how much we feed at a single feeding. And from data that we have available in the literature, it would suggest that feeding about eight and a half percent of the calf's body weight may be better than feeding 10 percent of body weight. Um, and in this case, if you're looking at a 97 pound Holstein calf on average, that's about a gallon um, for the eight and a half percent. So that's about what we normally feed. But we want to be careful to not feed too much in one feeding because there um, is su the suggestion in the literature that if you feed too much at once, you're delaying the way that this colostrum flows out of the out of the gut into um, or out of the out of the stomach into the gut, and then by delaying this outflow, you might actually lose some of this opportunity to take up the IgG in this bigger amount of colostrum. Um, I have to also tell you, there's not that much data out there. We're we're planning a study, hopefully, to assess this. But uh, keep in mind that recommendations that are out there sometimes pushing 12% of body weight. Um, would mean a whole lot of colostrum at once. Um, in this case, 1.4 gallon for uh, an, an average size 97 pound Holstein calf. Um, nobody would be feeding that, I think, voluntarily. So just be careful with with pushing pushing the feeding amount um, in a single feeding. And when should you be feeding colostrum? There's uh, this is very well documented. There's actually no debate about this. Um, colostrum should go into the calf as quickly as possible. Um, even though we think that there is some uptake of antibodies in the first 24 hours, it's much higher in the first one to four hours of life. Um, so we want to have colostrum available. We want to have it stored if we can't milk cows individually to feed colostrum. So we want to have a colostrum bank um, and be able to feed a calf um, within an hour to four hours after, after birth, ideally. Um, realize that when you do feed colostrum, the gut closure is accelerated. So once the gut sees colostrum, that is going to make it start um, closing down these these uh, these gaps in the intestine faster. Um, and I'm only telling you this not that you're delaying colostrum feeding, but to encourage you that if you have a calf that maybe has been born six to eight hours before and you know now you're worried, well, I didn't get it in there in the first one to four hours, there's still a chance you're getting a good amount of this uh, immunoglobulin across the, the intestine if it hasn't been fed before. So do feed it if you have to feed it later, um, but ideally feed it in the first one to four hours and, and don't make a later feeding um, the norm on the farm. Also, there are prolonged local effects. So even when the gut closes, um, we know that colostrum has some beneficial effects uh, locally in the gut. Talked a little bit about those growth factors that are good for the um, development of the calf. So um, that has a, a positive effect. And of course, the nutrients that we have in colostrum still have a, an effect. So if you're feeding a second feeding of colostrum or a third feeding of colostrum, even though maybe you're not getting things across the, the gut barrier anymore, you still have the benefit of that locally. How should you be feeding this? Um, temperature is very important. Um, if, if you're like me, you probably you know have to try this out uh, once or twice where the colostrum wasn't quite warm enough. Um, and for one reason or the other, you're trying to feed it when it's not uh, quite around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the result that you see is that the calf will start shivering and they will waste a lot of energy trying to warm up this uh, big portion of colostrum. So it's important that we have the patience to warm up the colostrum to the, um, uh, to the correct feeding temperature. And the rule for this would be, you know, if you have kids at home, you would have done this when they were babies, you can uh, test this on your wrist and it should be not too hot, um, but it should be warm enough and then you can feed it at a temperature. If you're feeding colostrum too hot, you're hurting um, the lining of the, of the stomach and that can have very detrimental effects on the, on the health of the, the, the rumen and the abomasum and um, we can get bloat from this, we can get abomasitis from this, so we have to make sure that we stay in the correct feeding temperatures. Does it matter if I uh, tube feed a calf or if um, if I let the calf suckle? Um, it seems that um, although colostrum goes into different compartments of the stomach system, depending on if you bottle feed or if, if you um, if you tube them, it doesn't matter where you put that colostrum in the first place. So if it's um, more convenient and you can get the colostrum into the calf um, by tubing it and you don't have the time to let them suckle, it will not change um, the uptake of the, of the antibodies, depending on the way you're feeding it. 
What about a second feeding of colostrum? Um, this is some data from uh, Mike Steele's group out of um, Guelph. And they could show here that when they are uh, mimicking um, uh, transition milk in a 50-50 mix, um, denoted here with MX, um, or if they're feeding straight colostrum for a second feeding at 12 hours after having fed one feeding of colostrum already, they could see this nice increase in IgG concentration um, in the group that was either fed a mix of colostrum and milk or actually a second feeding of straight colostrum. Um, and so this is to show that um, if you have time and if you have um, the ability and you have the material in your herd that um, allows for a second feeding or even subsequent feedings of colostrum or transition milk, you will um, get this benefit of bumping up the IgG concentration in the calf even more. These are the new recommendations for how we will check on uh, failure of transfer of passive immunity or um, better this, maybe the success of, of getting to where we need to go. Um, and in this table, there's four different categories now. So instead of, as we did before, just merely surpassing a certain threshold and saying, okay, that the calf passed or the calf failed. Now we are actually acknowledging that bumping up the calf in the categories um, the higher we get, the better um, we have uh, chances for keeping this calf healthy um, in the pre-weaning period. So acknowledging some of the data um, that's come out of the NAMS studies in the last um, uh, survey, and that was put together by a panel of experts to produce this table. So if you're using refractometers, you would be using uh, either, either the uh, serum total protein uh, column in here, or you would be using the serum bricks um, column and you can see these, these data suggest that the higher you get in these, the, the better it is for um, the calf. And the reason that they put this together is that they acknowledge that um, the different categories here on the left, the morbidity or disease proportion, and on the right, the survival of the calves, um, the survival was better, the disease proportion was lower, the higher we had these calves rise in these categories. So just to summarize this, um, this, this quite involved work, the more IgG you get in the calves, the less frequently they get sick and the more chances they have for survival. And so this transition milk period, as I said, is important um, as well. So you can feed a second feeding of colostrum if you have enough colostrum, but you can also feed transition milk to calves. And when you do that, um, because it's still higher, transition milk is before milk reaches the mature character, still higher in these growth factors, still higher in the nutrients, we know from data out there that we can improve the maturation of the gut of the calf. Um, and with the improved gut maturation, we have higher um, surface area and we have a better uptake of nutrients. This better uptake of nutrients improves the preventing growth and health. More of the nutrients that are available in the guts are then available to the calf. Um, and not all of this is explained by feeding this more nutrient dense uh, transition milk, but really most of it is explained by the calf being able to actually use nutrients better when it is fed um, milk later. And then we also know it increases IgG uptake as I've shown before in the data. And so together we know that if you can feed second feedings of colostrum or transition milk, we have the potential of increased health and growth and then also with that, the potential for increased future milk production in, in our calves. So with this going over the importance of how to um, maximize the benefits of colostrum and um, how to put together kind of a management scheme that you can um, check on and, and see if you're fulfilling the five Qs, I just wanted to go briefly over some data to suggest that we can influence the amount and the quality of colostrum with some of the things we do on farm. And I've just picked a few examples to show to you here. So first of all, why is this important? Um, this again is some data from um, a project that Trent completed and we looked at colostrum production on a number of different farms in New York. And we recognize that colostrum production, both in the uh, terms of the yield of colostrum as well as in terms of the quality, varies quite um, widely between different farms. So these are the median colostrum yields um, on a farm, and they range from median yields of two and a half to 7.6 kilo for heifers um, to, uh, and four to 7.7 .7 kilograms for cows. So you have some farms that have on average more than double the colostrum production than on other farms. 
And the same is true um, for quality. So we know that there's on-farm management strategies that influence colostrum production and quality. And so one of the probably now best documented um, uh, factors that uh, go into colostrum yield is to feed a, a moderate amount of starch in the close-up period. And this has now been shown in a few different independent studies. Um, one um, that we completed um, during my PhD, another one um, out of the Guelph group, and then uh, Trent could also show this in his observational data from this big um, field trial. And so what happens in um, feeding different energy concentrations in a dry period, just showing you here some of the data from the um, 2016 study, where we fed either 100%, 125%, or 150% of energy to cows, is that you do get a little bit of a dilution effect between um, these, these groups of cows that are fed different energy um, densities in the dry period, where you get more yield in cows that are getting fed a moderate or high um, uh, proportion of starch, and you get more concentrated colostrum in the cows that get fed, fed a controlled energy diet. So there's a little bit of a trade-off here um, but when you look at the data, only about 14% of the variability in the IgG concentration is merely explained by the difference in yield. So we're thinking that there is some, um, some effect of feeding the starch that is uh, independently influencing the, the colostrum yield um, of these cows and not just uh, diluting out what they would have given uh, in any case. Dry cow diet also can influence the colostrum fat component, um, similar to milk. To milk fat synthesis, we know that um, the mammary gland produces uh, fat components for colostrum and also takes up preformed fatty acids. And so the way that you're feeding cows in the prepartum period can also change the concentration of fat and the overall fat yield um, in colostrum. Looking at protein, um, there's been um, very old data um, until we revisited this a few years ago, different groups started revisiting this that suggests that you should not be um, depleting or restricting dry cows and protein um, in the dry period because that will uh, certainly have a negative impact on the yield and the, um, the quality of colostrum. We noticed mostly from beef cows. But here we were asking the question, what is the effect if we're providing more protein than we um, than we think we need based on the requirements that are out there. And the short answer is that it doesn't seem to provide a lot of um, benefit to the yield and the quality of colostrum, um, but there's some subgroups of cows that potentially uh, benefit from this protein in terms of colostrum production, and those seem to be the animals that are coming into the second lactation. Uh, sometimes in the studies, we see that there might be some benefit for them to be fed a higher protein um, ration, but not across the board. Um, we don't see this in the older animals or in heifers. And then as far as dry period nutrition goes for other factors, um, we um, have the chance of uh, using fatty acid supplementation in cows to get certain fatty acids across into colostrum. This has been shown, for example, for omega-3 fatty acids although the biological um, effect on the calf isn't, isn't quite clear yet to date. But this is something that we can keep in mind. We are able to get some of these fatty acids that we feed to the cow transferred into colostrum as well. Recently, there's been some more attention to trace mineral supplementation, vitamin supplementation, and choline supplementation in the dry period and how that affects um, the colostrum yield and, and uh, quality. As far as the trace minerals and the vitamins goes, um, we can show that uh, these get transferred to a greater degree into colostrum when they're getting fed at higher um, inclusion rates or in, in uh, organic form in the dry period ration. Um, they will then be in the colostrum um, and they will be available to the calf. Um, and uh, certain data would suggest that this is beneficial to get more of the trace minerals, more of the vitamins such as vitamin E into the calf um, for, for the uh, immediate transition from intrauterine to extrauterine life. Choline has also received recent attention. Um, uh, Trent has put together a review that, among other things, has looked at all the data out there on choline, and um, the jury is still quite um, you know, out there, um, but there are some data that suggest that choline supplementation actually increases 
the yield um, of colostrum production. And this seems to be potentially a herd specific effect. Um, so some herds seem to benefit from this choline supplementation while in other herds, the, the benefit was not um, shown. What has been shown consistently across the board is that when we alter our targeted dry period, we can alter colostrum yield. Um, and when we go um, very short in a dry period or, or there's no dry period, um, then we also have an effect of colostrum on colostrum quality. So the longer the dry period is, um, the more colostrum yield we get. Um, we've seen this in, in a number of different data sets um, and this is pretty consistent. So you can see here in the data that we have summarized for um, trend study that if you go from uh, 46 and under to 47 to 67 days and then over 60, um, uh, seven days that we see this nice increase in colostrum yield. So colostrum production is one, uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're planning for dry periods. Um, and uh, in general, if you're extending the dry period, you will get more colostrum production. This has been again shown in different studies. Um, and in summary, what we can say is that unless we go under 30 days, we usually don't see uh, a big effect on the colostrum quality um, in colostrum uh, IgG. And then parity. So we talked a little bit about the dry period length. Here's um, parity. I like to show this graph just to rem remind us that yes, um, heifer colostrum uh, is, is different from mature cow colostrum, but not um, poor quality per se. So heifers can make very good quality um, colostrum and uh, on average, they can make a, a good amount of colostrum as well. Although we know that um, second parity cows, so cows coming into the second lactation make usually the most amount, the most yield of colostrum. This is, again been shown pretty consistently. And then as cows get older, then the colostrum production um, tapers off a little bit again. As far as quality goes, this is um, the, the graphs on the right-hand side. Yes, um, heifers have lower concentration of immunoglobulins on average, but still um, in most herds, most heifers make good quality colostrum. And so I would not discard um, heifer colostrum per se. I would test it um, according to the guidelines I had showed previously with using Brix percent um, and make sure that you're selecting good heifer colostrum to be fed to calves as well. The reason for the increase in quality with the older age, um, there is some increase in immunoglobulins that is circulating in the blood of these older cows. And so probably some of this increase is just that there's more antibodies circulating in the blood of the cows. And so there's more antibodies that can go into colostrum as well. And then there is the seasonality that we have to keep in mind um, that some of you may have experienced. Um, and it's a little bit frustrating um, it happened to us on a number of studies where everything's going great, we have enough colostrum and we're hitting October, November, and uh, it seems like we can't get colostrum out of the cows anymore. So this is shown in this graph that also can um, probably reflect the, you know, the wide variability in colostrum production overall, but you can see this trend where in the summer months we have more colostrum and in the winter months we get um, less um, quantity of colostrum across the board. So why is this happening? Um, we have been chasing a little bit the, the temperature humidity index and the light exposure. And uh, what we have found in, uh, in our study and what has also been shown in another study is that when cows get exposed to more heat um, within reasoning, so not, not in terms of heat stress, they seem to be responding with higher colostrum yields. When they have been exposed to higher light intensities also, they have been shown to produce more colostrum. Um, so within the last two weeks before calving, if there was a higher light intensity, more lux, which is an indicator of light, um, we saw um, higher colostrum yields. So now um, going into uh, heat stress, um, we would recognize that heat stress is detrimental to, um, to, to dry cows and for their future production. Um, but if you specifically look at the cooling of cows under heat stress, there are mixed effects on the colostrum production and the colostrum quality. So um, we're not entirely sure yet um, what the heat stress effects are in colostrum per se, but, but we know from all the other data that heat stress is bad in cows and that we should provide um, heat abatement to, to uh, cows that are at risk of being heat stressed in the dry period. 
what happens when cows have intramammary infections, mastitis at the time of calving? Um, there are very few studies that have looked at this, and um, the, the summary of those studies is that there probably isn't a significant effect um, on the quality of colostrum on the IgG concentration, but you may end up with cows that produce less colostrum yield, um, and their components such as protein might be affected by the mastitis. We do not recommend to feeding colostrum from overtly mastitic cows to calves, um, not just for the in terms of transfer of passive immunity, but also because we um, we obviously worry about the bacteria that might be causing the the mastitis, and so we would recommend to discard mast uh, mastitic cow colostrum just based on these um, these considerations for potential transfer of pathogens to the calves. And then harvest of colostrum. Um, there's been uh, relatively little attention paid to how we, how what are the best recommendations for get, getting colostrum out of the cows. So we're worrying about um, how to make them produce good colostrum, but what is the best way of actually getting it into the bucket? Um, a group out of Germany has looked at this in terms of using oxytocin at time of colostrum harvest. And surprisingly, um, against their hypothesis, they couldn't find an effect on increased yield when they were using it. But they saw a little bit of an increase in IgG concentration, uh, uh, quite a small increase. Um, but again, um, no increase on yield, which is what we would normally use oxytocin for, for milk letdown. So what is the best milking routine to harvest colostrum? There's still a question mark in that regard. Um, at, the at this time, we recommend to harvest colostrum just the same way you're harvesting um, milk in general making sure that if you're using a bucket milker specifically for colostrum, that it's getting checked routinely and that you're not having any malfunctioning in the system, which can contribute to you not um, being able to get the yield out of these cows that you were expecting. And one question then for harvest is, how long can I wait to milk the cows after calving? Um, the time to harvest here shown from two different studies um, does not have a linear effect on colostrum concentrate, uh, IgG concentration meaning that you have a few hours after the cow has calved to get colostrum out of them and not lose any of the quality of the colostrum. But then when you hit a certain threshold around eight or nine hours, you get a rapid decline in the in the quality. So in most systems where you milk cows at least three times a day, you can probably get the best quality of colostrum um, that way. Uh, again, recognize that you don't want to wait eight or nine hours to feed the calf. So in these instances, if you can only milk three times a day, you're probably uh, working with a colostrum bank to get the calves fed pretty quickly. So in summary, I hope um, I could review and remind you of some of the important on-farm opportunities um, regarding the quantity, the quality, um, how we check for um, the cleanliness of colostrum, how we check for the transfer of passive immunity in these calves and why it matters. Um, I would suggest that you can't ma manage what you could not measure. So if you have questions on colostrum on your particular farm, I would encourage you to start measuring it. Um, measure the colostrum quantity, get a BRICS reflectometer if you don't have one, and just start seeing which are the groups of cows that maybe you're having issues with. Is it all the cows? Is it subgroups of cows? And then once you have identified um, where you see some opportunity, then you can work with your um with your management, farm advisors, and in trying to address these issues that you may have identified. Colostrum production is variable between animals inside of one farm and then between farms. So there's different factors that um, come to play here. And I just touched on a few of them to not overload this webinar, but if you have questions, I'm happy to um, provide you with some more data on other uh, factors that might also influence colostrum production. Dry period. Nutrition and management affect colostrum production. I think I see some of the biggest um, opportunities for us to manage colostrum in this time period. And then the seasonal variation is not fully understood. And because we don't fully understand it, we are not having um, any options to mitigate it. So at this time, we're advising to just plan ahead for the seasonal variation by having enough colostrum stored um, in an appropriate fashion to make it through these times of low supply. And then time to harvest is not linear, um, which is, is actually good news for us on, on farms that are milking three times, um, that you don't have to worry too much about losing the quality and colostrum. But I would suggest not to let um, cows sit too long, not go over eight to nine hours before you get colostrum harvested so that you don't use the quality. And with this, I hope 
I have enough time left over to uh, answer some of the questions that may have come in as I was uh, talking uh, about all of these things. But if your question is not getting addressed, here's my email address. You're welcome to reach out to me directly, um, probably also to, to the program to get the questions across, um, but don't hesitate to, to send me an email. Um, acknowledging the funding sources that have um, all contributed to the data that I was able to show today um, that comes out of our own lab. And with that, I would be happy to answer or try to answer any questions that are coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Menos. Very, very good. Uh, you covered a lot of things. Uh, we have a couple of questions on the q and I don't know if we're going to be able to like answer all of them. Uh, we might need to go a little over one. So yep. every, like if people that are like online can stay a little bit over, we're going to try to like address some, but you know, participants feel free to also like hop off because we know we understand that like timing can be a valuable resource. So I'm going to try to like choose some of them and like try to answer some. Mm -hmm. um, I have one question here saying, since vast majority of heifer calf Holsteins are products of sexed female semen and virgin heifer dams, which typically have lower birth weights, uh, lower than 97 pounds, mm -hmm. should we change our recommendations for colostrum feeding for those smaller calves? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, when we look at our data sets, if I if I look specifically at the heifer calves, they're usually you know more around eighty eight to ninety three pounds, so a little bit lighter than maybe our average um, calf weight when we're counting uh, male calves in there as well. Um, what I would say is that we don't have good data for me to tell you it's okay to go down to three liters. You know, um, don't don't worry about feeding a whole gallon. Um, at this time, I would still suggest to stick with with about a gallon for these calves, um, because then you know you're getting the eight and a half percent of body weight in most of them. Um, until we have more data to suggest that maybe you should go lower and and maybe prioritize second feedings rather than giving too much at one feeding, I would say stick with with the recommendations right now for a gallon, but don't go over don't go over that. And then recognizing that when we talk about Jersey calves, which we don't have a lot in our area, but um, obviously, they're much smaller than our Holsteins, and so we would be feeding a smaller amount of colostrum for them. Um, so, so they would follow the 10% body weight? Yeah, yeah. So okay. so every farm is a little bit different with their average um, calf weights. So if you have the calf weights and you can figure out where are you with the 8.5%, then maybe you could just adjust your colostrum portions to 3.2, 3.3 liters, 3.4 liters, Um and uh, it's also important to recognize that if you if the farm that you know you're on has good quality of colostrum, then you're you're safe with this with this feeding recommendation. You only get into trouble if the quality of colostrum is borderline, and then then we're using quantity to make up for the quality. Um, so it, it's important to recognize where you are with the quality as well. And Rick's percent can help you just get an idea of, of how good the quality is. So if you're constantly over 24, 25, 26 percent, you have good quality colostrum, you can probably adjust your feeding um, levels if you have smaller calves. That was a very long answer, hopefully, that addressed yeah. the, the question. <laughs> yeah, no, I I mean, measuring is important, so I, I get, yeah. I think they will, you know, appreciate the answer. Yeah. Um, so the next question is about that graphic you have about like disease and colostrum. I think mm -hmm. it's the Lombard data. Yep. Uh, they are asking why the top calves with more IgGs are second in the survival instead mm -hmm. of first. Yeah, great question. So um, uh, somebody was paying really uh, yeah. close attention to this. So in the survival graphs, the ones that are in the second category are kind of surpassing the ones that are in the excellent category. The difference between them is not very big. So graphically, you can see it, but um, they're, they're not separating out enough between each other, um, which just means that if you're in a good quality um, or in, in a good category, in the excellent category, you probably get the same chances of survival in these calves. Um, where we see the separation is then in the other two categories where it drops off quite a bit. Um, I don't think it's worth going back to the graph. So they, so they get sick. They they would have a difference in how much they get sick between the good and excellent. They do, they, yes. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't necessarily have a difference in like how many of them are dying, right? Yes, that, yes. Okay. So yeah, it's, two, still, it's still worth it to try to target for excellent mm -hmm. because of the animals that are getting sick. Is that what it is? Yes, it, yes. Based on the... Is? based on the morbidity category. And so there's been a few more studies that have looked at these four categories to see if it really pans out that it's worth 
shooting for more, shooting for higher. And uh, in each study, they found different positive aspects. And in each study, they found some differences as well. Um, so it's not like you can always expect the calves to do better. You can always expect them to grow better. It, there's a farm effect to these things as well. But but overall, the data would suggest that going higher gets you the most uh, positive benefits um, as far as health, survival, growth, and future milk production potential. Awesome. Yeah, no, that qualifies also for me. So good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the, not, the next question is, uh, we use potassium sorbate as a preservative for colostrum. Mm -hmm. Is it a good practice or does this material have any negative effect on colostrum quality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So I don't have a lot of um, personal experience with potassium sorbate, but it's a it's a um, food additive, so it's safe um, to use. Um, if you use it, you probably have a good reason for doing so. I would um, always bring back to the table the discussion of why are you using it? Is there maybe a way um, around it? Or maybe there's a way of um, of um, of getting the management to where you're not having to rely on adding it to the colostrum. Um, but it is not, sh it's not showing any detriments when used um, according to recommendations. Yeah, it okay. does not affect it negatively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there are two questions that address the same topic, which is uh, starch energy uh, mm -hmm. related to colostrum. Uh, so one is, is the colostrum yield increased with higher starch? Uh, is the is the increase in colostrum due to, due to the starch in dry cow's energy or due to an increase in the metabolizable protein yield? Mm -hmm. And is it 18% uh, of starch optimal? Mm -hmm. So some numbers on it. Yeah. So I think the question was, um, are we getting the benefit um, for the colostrum yield uh, truly because we're getting more energy into these animals or actually because there is a there is a, a secondary effect on getting more MP in cows um, getting fed the higher starch. So from the studies that we have available, um, I would say that we are singling um, this effect out to really be the energy that we're providing to these cows. Um, if you're now asking me what's the exact mechanism of how this happens, we don't know. Um, we don't know if um, if this uh, if this added carbohydrate component um, changes hormones, the endocrine milieu in these prepartum cows, or if the glucose that we're getting out of it directly affects colostrum production. Um, we don't know. But when we're looking at um, singling out the effect of MP, um, then we're not seeing this benefit um, across the board. So I would really say that we're getting this um, from the starch, from the carbohydrate component. Um, and not the MP effect that it would have in the dry period. Uh, on another note, which is a more like curiosity, which I also have, uh, someone was asking, I recently saw a Ned selling powdered dairy cow colostrum for human consumption. Will people receive any benefit on, or like detriment from colostrum consumption? Okay, that's a... That's a question probably for another webinar and probably for a person who's yeah. an expert in this. But it's 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 funny because I just discussed it with a student of mine yesterday who in the gym heard that, you know, you should be eating bovine colostrum powder because it makes you stronger. Um, so there's um, the person who asked the question, if they're just sending me an email, I will get them a nice paper that reviews the human um, health benefits of colostrum. Um there is a lot that's being looked at right now for human athletes, but there's also some work that's being done for humans with asthma and humans with inflammatory diseases um, as far as seeing if colostrum, bovine colostrum has a benefit to them. Um, I can tell you it's a hot topic of research right now. Um, if I had to summarize it, I would say there are some health claims being made, but not all of them are backed up by data at this point. But again, I'm not an expert in the nutraceutical effects of bovine colostrum on humans, but happy to share um, some papers that I have available that for the person to to read over and, and get some more knowledge on this. Okay. And I'm going to uh, choose two more questions and mm -hmm. then we wrap up so we stay on time. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, if cows are producing colostrum most of their dry period, mm -hmm. why would someone see about 10% of dry cows calving in with no colostrum? Yeah. So so 10% of dry cows calving in with no colostrum would be higher than what we no would normally expect. Um so so that might be worth having a, a, a conversation just about why is it so many of them and what time of the year are those happening. Um, we see cows calving in with no colostrum more in the fall months when we have the seasonal decline in any case. We see it with cows that are giving birth to um, stillborn calves. 
we see it with cows um, that um, uh, I would have to go back to the data to look specifically at the factors for cows that are giving no colostrum. Um, but what I what I would say is that we have this ongoing colostrogenesis for the entire dry period, but there is something that's happening in this last you know few days up to a week before calving, and we can appreciate that by seeing that the udders you know the cows are uttering up and we see a change in the shape of the udder. So there is a lot happening in this last week, but I'm trying to also say that it's not nothing that happens before. So I was trying to show this like slow ramp up of colostrum production and then this big peak. Um, so that would maybe explain why if this last week is affected one way or the other in, in this herd and you're getting 10% of cows with no colostrum, um, that there may be something specific to this period of time. Um, we do see more cows producing no or barely any colostrum, um, again, in the fall months. And uh, it's been reported to us that in, in the herds that are experiencing this, some of the adjustments to the dry cow ration um, seem to be um, positive. And, and some of that is uh, what gets reported to us from the field, adjusting the, the energy um, in the dry cow ration. So uh, would be maybe an opportunity to talk to your nutritionist about this and see if maybe you can play around with um, the composition of the dry cow ration in specific times of the year when you're having specific issues with colostrum production. Okay. Uh, and the last question, I'm going to actually combine two because mm -hmm. there are two good ones. So the first one is, if only lower quality colostrum is available, mm -hmm. would you and what BRICS level would you recommend to supplement IgG levels? If yes, what kind of products would you recommend? So would you recommend like completed and also on the same token someone is asking about transition milk and like how long uh should should we be if if we need to how long we should be feeding transition milk to you know improve the benefits that the research are showing okay um i guess i would start with if only lower quality colostrum is available um for the time being you know you have to work with that but um i would encourage the person to look into why is the quality low um and look at the factors that are influencing IgG concentration in colostrum and see if maybe some of this can be affected long-term. Short-term, um, I, I believe that it depends a little bit on um, the risks that you're willing to take, how low you go in bricks, where you put your cutoff. Um, and it's also worth sending in some samples or you know working with one of your advisors to try to check and see the bricks level on your farm with your bricks refractometer, what it does it translate to. You can take the data from the literature and say, okay, I'm going to cut off at 21% or 22%. But I have to tell you that every time we run a study and we look at this cutoff, it changes a little bit. Um, when we're looking at what does it translate to, you know, good, good quality colostrum at 50 grams per liter. So you can probably go lower at 21%, 20% um, at the expense of maybe feeding some colostrum that doesn't have quite 50 grams per liter in there. That again goes back to what I said, you know, you're making up for quality and quantity. So then in those specific instances, you probably don't want to cut back on the volume you're feeding, because if you're feeding a whole gallon, at least you get, you know, if it's lower concentration, you get more total IgG into the calf. If you're really struggling with having enough colostrum that's kind of at this level of cutoff um, or above, you can supplement colostrum with colostrum replacer products with powder. Um, there's some good data out there um, that I can share. Again, if you contact me, um, I'll, I'll give you some specifics on this. Um, something to recognize is that you can't dump endless powder of colostrum replacer into colostrum because it will make it very concentrated in the form of salt. And when you make it very concentrated in the form of salts um, and increase the osmolarity of colostrum, you're going to decrease the outflow of it from the, from the stomach. And so that is negative in terms of then being able to absorb the the immunoglobulins. So you can you can rescue some colostrum, but you can't rescue the poorest of colostrum with um, putting some powder in there to to increase the, the quality. Which one would I recommend? I don't have a specific um, company. Um, I think there's many different good colostrum replacers out there that you can use to, to do this with um, to some extent. And then another question was, Camila, I think there was a uh, part of the question. You, how long, how long uh, there is research showing that the, there is a benefit to supplementing uh, transition, transition milk, milk. Or, you know, or like yeah. a colostrum replacer to milk or like after, you know, uh, the 24 hours that we already do. 
Yeah, so the question about how long would you be either feeding um, some colostrum in addition to milk or feeding tr transition milk depends on the benefit you're trying to, to, to get out of this. If you're trying to get IgG concentration out of this, you need to get it in in the first 24 hours. And that's where I shared a second feeding of colostrum at 12 hours can bump up the immunoglobulin concentration quite um, visibly. If you're trying to get the benefit of having higher nutrient concentration, um, then you can give this at any time. And there's data out there to suggest also that if you can supplement colostrum at times of high stress, when the animals are at high risk of diarrhea, um, that it will benefit the calves, even when you're at one, two, three, four weeks of age, um, will likely be of benefit of the calves um, in, in preventing um, some of these diarrhea episodes. A lot more work needs to be done in that respect. But again, it depends on what are you trying to get out of the colostrum or transition milk? How long would you be feeding it for? Nutrients will go, you know, anytime you put that in there, the growth factors are important in the first few days of life to kind of get the gut to where, where it's nice and mature and can take up the nutrients. And then some of these other things in colostrum that we, you know, are in this other little category, probably have this effect on uh, preventing health events or, or being even um, helpful in treatment of diarrhea beyond the first few weeks, um, because they have a local effect in the gut. Nutrients will go, you know, anytime you put that in there, the growth factors are important in the first few days of life to kind of get the gut to where it's nice and mature and can take up the nutrients. And then some of these other